let me say to him and to members of the House that in any case, Chapter 4 of the UN Convention Against Corruption, Articles 43 to 49, says under those articles that states' parties are obliged to assist one another in every aspect of the fight against corruption, including prevention, investigation, and prosecution of offenders. And it explicitly adds, sir, that countries that do not criminalize certain kinds of corruption would be obliged to cooperate with other states that had done so. So if there is a state that in pursuance of the states' rights theories we've heard today, chooses not to criminalize corruption of certain sorts, the government of India, as a signatory, signatory to the UN Corruption uh, Convention, is obliged to cooperate nonetheless, and cooperation in criminal matters is mandatory. So it's extremely important to understand that this is a serious international obligation we have taken on. Chapter 8 of the UN Convention, Article 65 to 69, stress further that the UN's Convention's requirements are to be interpreted as minimum standards, which states' parties are actually invited to exceed with measures more strict or severe, that's a quote, more strict or severe than those that are in the Convention. Not less strict or severe, but more. I must disagree, Mr. Chairman, with those in this debate who have said that these are international standards, European standards, somebody said, that don't apply to the Indian reality. In what way is India inferior to Europe or to any other part of the world. We can have the same standards, we can have better standards, Mr. Chairman. We do not need to dilute our laws by absolving the states of their responsibility. Now, the, uh, the Honorable Leader of the Opposition once again made this argument that this is a weak bill, that it fails because it separates the power to inquire, to investigate and to prosecute. But to my mind, Mr. Chairman, that is a strength, not a weakness. Would you want the police in your country to be able to inquire, to be able to arrest, to be able to prosecute, and to be able to judge you? No. Then why would you want your Lokpal to be able to do that? It is not democratic. In fact, the suggestion that the failure to give the Lokpal administrative and financial control of the CBI is a way of making the bill weak is completely ill-founded. The Lokpal, and indeed the Lokayukta in the States, the Lokpal is positioned as an independent agency exclusively responsible for the superintendence and direction of investigation and prosecution. You cannot expect the Lokpal to be simultaneously the investigator as well as have the power of superintendence and control over the investigator. That is a fundamental contradiction. But what does superintendence and control of investigation mean? There is the 1997 Supreme Court judgment, Hawala judgment as it's well known, which sets the constitutional benchmark for the independence of investigation. What does the Supreme Court say in that judgment? It says investigators are answerable to the law and to the law alone, not to the government. The Supreme Court distinguishes between interference in the investigation of cases on hand by the government, which it prohibits. So the government cannot interfere in the actual investigation. But it makes a distinction between that and government administrative and financial control over the investigation, which it considers totally legitimate. So in the bill that we have before us, Section 25 protects the independence of the investigative process while leading the government to fulfill its constitutional and legal duties and responsibilities to the officers of the government. In any case, financial independence is granted by the fact that the funding for the Lokpal is assigned to the Consolidated Fund of India and of the Lok Ayuktas to the Consolidated Fund of the States. There's been a discussion, Mr. Chairman, on the question of minority representation. All I can say is that the objective is very clear, that such a powerful and important body coming up in response to such a mass demand must be as representative as possible of the rich diversity of our country. This was the principle behind which we fought for our own independence, where we said, India cannot be ruled by people who are not Indians. We must accept that within India, there are people of various backgrounds who would want to see people of their backgrounds represented in these crucial decision-making processes, and the Lokpal cannot, cannot be an exception. Let me say, Mr. Chairman, that to those who have raised their concerns about the bill, to those outside this House who have attended rallies, who have spoken out, who appeared on television, I think it is time for this House to say, your voice has been heard. We have listened to you. With the passage of this bill, 
the fight against corruption would now be on stronger and newer footing. Perhaps the bill is not everything you had hoped for. Perhaps it does not contain every provision, dot every I and cross every T as you would have liked, but change has its own momentum. Think of the Right to Information Act, the RTI. Think what people assumed when the bill was being passed and think how strong and effective it has become. All of us, I'm sure, have had to taste its sharp edge. So let us see this bill work in practice. Let us, if necessary, in the fullness of time, adjust this to the experience that we should have. But after all, our constitution has been amended over 100 times. We can't afford to take the position, as some outside this house have done, of my way or the highway. We must urge people to avoid extreme positions, to respect the outcomes of deliberative democracy, which is what we have seen in action in this House today, uh, Mr. Chairman. We cannot afford to be in too much of a hurry. There is an old saying in English that one should beware the young doctor and the old barber. Both in haste can cause a great deal of damage. And there is a fear that we have too many young doctors and too many old barbers behind the versions we are hearing outside this House. Let me stress, Mr. Chairman, even this bill, and certainly not the bill that was proposed from outside, offers a magic bullet. It is not a panacea. Corruption is not going to dis disappear overnight. This bill must be and must be seen as part of a much broader set of laws and institutions in our country. The Prevention of Corruption Act 1988, which has been mentioned. The Prevention of Money Laundering Act 2002, which has not been mentioned. The RTI Act itself, the institutions of the Central Vigilance Commission, of the CBI, of the Controller and Auditor General, of the Enforcement Directorate. It has to be seen as part of international obligations under the UN Convention Against Corruption. And it must be seen domestically as being strengthened and buttressed by our vibrant media, by our rich civil society, which too will ensure that this act works well. Today. We have the whistleblowers bill before us, the public interest disclosure and protection to persons making the disclosures bill. That too will be one more pillar strengthening our efforts against corruption. The judicial standards and accountability bill is coming. I'm sure that the government is giving thought to a procurement bill. Tax reform, which our finance minister has been working on for some time, and, and we heard refer, reference to it in the black money debate we had so recently in this very house. Campaign finance reform, how can we as politicians shy away from recognizing that there is a real problem with black money in elections and that too contributes to the concerns of corruption that our people around this country have? Grievance redressal mechanisms, we've heard reference to them. The need to simplify laws and regulations in our country and increase administrative transparency. Reforms to prevent tax, to, to, to prevent tax evasion and indeed, as has often been said by our Prime Minister himself, to reduce the discretionary powers of officials and ministers so that indeed they should not be, there should not be corruption. Let us admit that the all-pervasive nature of our state is part of the problem. The state is present in so many aspects of our country's social and economic life, buttressed by such a complex set of laws and regulations requiring approvals by so many officials at so many various levels, of course it provides opportunities for corruption. When the state is a producer and supplier of so many services, then those who work for the state, especially in financial decision making, have, I'm afraid, the opportunity to profit from the power to permit. They have the power to say no at many levels and the ultimate power to say yes. And while honest officials, political or bureaucratic, will not profit from it, there are some who cannot resist the temptation. The truth is, of course, that just moving the process forward can be monetized, and corruption is real, as many of us know from our own experiences. But I want to say to those outside who have been seeing in one piece of legislation prepared outside this House the answer to all their worries, I would like to say to them, let us never forget the wise words of our great founding father, Mahatma Gandhi himself, who more than 70 years ago said, be the change you wish to see in the world. Who is responsible ultimately for corruption, if not ourselves as citizens of India? I say to those outside watching our deliberations in this house, for every bribe taker, there is a bribe giver. 
There is somebody who is trying to short circuit the process, get a shortcut, avoid punishment by the government, avoid a law, avoid a tax. And the fact is that we cannot merely point fingers at the system, merely clamor for some sort of supra powerful legal body and not forget the moral responsibility of society to change for the better. And that we can do because we are a democracy. And I urge the House today to adopt this bill because it is a way of strengthening our democracy as a nation. We have seen this year in 2011 what happens in other countries where there is no effective democracy. We have seen in our brothers in the Arab world, we've seen the, the, the throngs in the streets, we've seen the jasmine revolutions. But we don't need jasmine revolutions because the fragrance of jasmine is in our nostrils through our democracy. Mr. Chairman, I'll just be two minutes. The fact is, we have evolved our own corrective mechanisms, and this bill is an example of such a mechanism. Others may have bullets, we have ballots. Others have civil wars, we have civil society. Others clutch at straws, we make laws. Let us today uphold our finest democratic traditions by passing this bill. And, and let us say, Mr. Chairman, to those outside, it is time to move on. To the people of India, let us say, do not, fray, do not fall prey to the blandishments of those who would destabilize our country, who would do so on the altar of their own infallibility. They are not infallible. We in this House are not infallible, but we are doing our best. We have you, the people of India, have elected this parliament. Have faith in our judgment and good sense, in our good faith in what we are trying to do. We are here, and I know our Prime Minister is here, only to uphold what we believe is in the best interest of this country, its people, of this nation. We are asking people to trust us, but we are doing so after wide consultation and after 42 years of stalemate on this vital institution. Let us please, Mr. Chairman, let us say that in this anniversary, the centenary year of the first singing of Janagana Mana, let us tell ourselves that Parliament must act in the loftiest, most noble spirit of that national anthem. A hundred years ago today at the Kolkata session of the Indian National Congress, Janagana Mana was sung for the first time. And the next time we sing it, let us sing it in the knowledge that we have stood up against corruption, that we have stood for an institution that strengthens our country, that has emerged from our democracy, that we have discussed the merits and demerits of, that we have come to the conclusion benefits this nation and people, and let us move forward and onward towards, towards the kind of India that that national anthem stands for. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.